And amen. Dear brother in the Lord, he is. I encourage you to pray for him and his family to be fruitful where God is planting them. Um, we had the privilege of actually seeing him last night also. Brother, you get a word on that later? Yes. All right, so brothers and sisters, I have the privilege of um, reading to you some of the most exceptional words ever written to mankind. Um, this is going to come from Matthew chapter 6, which is one of Jesus Christ's recorded sermons. It's an incredible privilege. We get to hear our king, our master, um, bring his word uh, to our souls. And I have the privilege of reading to you uh, verses 1 through 18. So brothers and sisters, I ask that you please stand in reverence for the reading of God's word. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to see be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive the sins of others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not appear obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. May God bless the reading of His word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen. So as you know, uh, this morning we're beginning a new worship series, uh, five weeks in duration. Uh, Brother John and I, have, and I have the privilege for five weeks, five weeks only, mind you, no, I'm only kidding, to speak on prayer. 
And uh, it's a really overwhelming, daunting task, actually, to pick five passages. Uh, not that we won't speak about prayer. We speak about prayer a lot. But for this uh, series of messages, picking five passages. Uh, what five? That's why I asked. I haven't heard anything from anybody. That's okay. If you have a passage on prayer that uh, intrigues you or uh, you'd like to hear something about from the pulpit, let us know. It could be included in the next four, one of the next four, maybe. Um, the title of the series is um, Hastening the Coming of the Lord, right? Coming off of the last series we were in, in Second Peter, that verse said, Hastening the Coming Day of the Lord. Looking forward to that coming day of the Lord. And one of the ways we can hasten it on the coming day of the Lord and show presently we're looking forward to the coming day of the Lord is by, through prayer, and by coming together in corporate prayer as we are uh, have the opportunity to do for these next five Sundays to apply the message. The Bible says, looking forward, hastening the coming day of the Lord in 2 Peter 3, 12a. So, the title of the message this morning is simply, Lord, teach us to pray. And the central idea of the text is simple. Believers pray. Believers pray. We do. Believers pray. Privately, corporately, publicly. Believers pray. Because when we pray, privately, publicly, corporately, we can honor God and we can obey God. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, the privilege of prayer all kinds of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the example of you more than anybody else has ever walked this planet. You, Lord Jesus, prayed. You prayed in private. You prayed in the morning. You prayed in the night. You prayed without ceasing. You prayed in public. You prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done. Thank you, Lord, for um, the privilege of prayer. Show us, Lord, what we need to learn as we uh, seek to hasten the coming day of the Lord and growing in love for one another through our praying together. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to start with verse 5. So one of four times, and when you pray. Okay? So obviously it's a given, and when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. That is not an admonition to not pray publicly. Okay? I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. The issue here was the, uh, the motivation of their heart, why they would be praying uh, in public and, uh, and on street corners. If your motivation, if our motivation is to be seen by others or to be heard by others, then that's um, the wrong motivation for praying together uh, in a corporate kind of setting. You know, the scribes and Pharisees, they were actors, they were pretenders, they, the word hypocrite means like wearing a mask, and um, Jesus warned of the Pharisees, warned about our being aware of uh, religious activities done behind the wrong, with the wrong heart and the wrong motive. Done to be seen by others. So beloved believers, right? Beloved believers, you all, we need to beware of hypocritical praying. What is hypocritical praying? Well, if you take the example of the Pharisees there, it's that showy, ostentatious, look at me, listen to me kind of pray. You know what else is a form of hypocritical praying? And this is not a reason not to come and pray tonight. This is a reason to come and pray tonight with the right motive, and with the right heart. But you know what else would be hypocritical praying? Any kind of obligatory, gotta go to prayer meeting tonight at 6 o'clock, boy oh boy, finally, I gotta go. That would be hypocritical praying. Instead, don't even use that as an excuse to stay home. 
but instead use that as a motivation to check your heart and go to pray corporately with your brothers and sisters in Christ for these five weeks out of love for the body of Christ, out of, out of obedience to what the scripture says, out of love for Jesus Christ, out of love for one another, and the opportunity to come to each other, with each other, just for five weeks, for corporate prayer. And in that way, we'd be hastening the coming day of the Lord. And in that way, we would be growing in Christ-likeness and really in fellowship with one another. We actually would be growing in fellowship with one another when we come together in prayer. We would be like that example of uh, Garrett at the church that he was in where he said that the church preached the gospel faithfully and they loved one another, demonstrated their love for one another as a church body. This is one opportunity right here to demonstrate our love for one another and love for the body by coming together in corporate prayer, not like the Pharisees do, did. And when we pray that way, we honor and obey God. So believers pray. We really do. It says, and when you pray, as I said, that's like four times in these few verses, and when you pray, and when you give, and when you fast, it's... Uh, Assume that's what we will do. And this is really when you pray is like Christianity 101. This is like not even 101. This is like preschool. This is like kindergarten. This is like, you know, the beginning. In our in our kids' school, if I can remember correctly, they had a test on the Bible a couple of weeks ago. And one of the questions that they had to be able to answer on the test, of which both of them did really well on, it was like um, I forget what the question was, but it was along the lines of how do we live the Christian life? How do we demonstrate? What are some of the ways we demonstrate that we're following the Lord? What are some ways that we show we're coming together with other people as believers in Christ? And the answers they had to give were go to church, read the Bible, fellowship with other Christians, and pray. Some of the basics of Christianity. So when it says here, when you pray, the reference here is to all prayer in general. Thanksgiving, praise, adoration, confession, petition, intercession, and actually this prayer where the disciples in Luke 1, Luke 11, verse 1 said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said what he said here in verse 9, this is how you ought to pray. And then comes um, the Lord's prayer. It, all those ingredients are included there. He says here, you are not to be like the hypocrites who were pretenders, pretenders to the faith. We covered how they love to sit on the corners and on the synagogues, corners at the synagogue where they could get the largest audience. And you know, when you pray like that, it says truly, they have their reward. Here was the essence also of their prayer. And, and I've been in prayer meetings like this. Their prayers were not directed to God, but they were directed to other people, other men, other women, other people in the room. And we've been in prayer meetings. I'm not even talking about here, per se. Uh, we can we, we think of examples. Remember times of being in prayer meetings where it's like people are really talking to one each, each other Sometimes even, I've been, been in one where they're actually rebuking each other through their public prayer. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. I'll read those verses. Luke 18, the Bible has just so many different uh, wonderful examples as it speaks about scripture, as it speaks about praying. Luke 18, <clears throat> verse 9. More about the Pharisees. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week, I pay tithes on all I get. The tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating in his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I mean, we just said in the beginning in the introduction, kind of, the challenge of taking five weeks, five scriptures on prayer and, and, and sharing them with you. And I wasn't even actually, at that moment, thinking about this one, right? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the opposite of the pharisaical type of praying. I tell you, this man went to his house justified. Rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself, so hypocritical praying, we could be exalting ourselves to be heard by men. We could come together tonight humbly, brothers and sisters in Christ, vulnerable even before our brothers and sisters in Christ and praying for one another. He who humbles himself, you know, it takes humility even to share your prayer concern. Ever think about that? Can't trust some people. It takes humility. But you grow in Christ likeness, you grow in holiness. We grow as the body of Christ. We grow as believers in Christ when we do that. Verse 6 says, But when you pray, once again, not if you pray, this is the second or four times of the importance of prayer mentioned in these short verses. <clears throat> Go into your inner room, and when you have prayed, shut the door. So here we got, you know, the example of private prayer, right? How devoted are we to private prayer? And I've said this before, or I've thought this before. I don't know if there's a direct correlation to this. But I say the, there's an increased possibility of our participating in corporate prayer. I think there's an increased, response, increased possibility for us to take the step toward corporate prayer especially for a short season of corporate prayer like we're talking about, when we're really just steeped in private prayer, like in praying without ceasing. Brother John talks about that. You're going to talk about that sometime, brother, praying without ceasing. It's like, the more we're devoted to private prayer, then, okay, public prayer, fine. So this is not, I mean, corporate prayer, okay, this is another opportunity to gather together, together to pray. How much do we practice private prayer? Pray to your Father who's in secret. So, yeah, much of our prayer life, not all of our prayer life, much of our prayer life, the bulk of our prayer life should be in private, or is in private, is in secret, praying without ceasing. Let me read some verses on that, and of course, you don't get any better than our Lord's example. Mark, chapter 1. Verse 35. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to his secluded, secluded place and was praying there. Got away from all the noise. Got away. Someone had texted me this past week. Very nice text. I got many nice texts this past week. Or many of you, and you know, you know, things that are going on here with me. And the um, person said, maybe you should get away from all the noise. Like, try this, try this, try that. Just think about this. Think about this solution. Think about that solution. I go, sister, I thought about every single possible scenario and solution that there is. I, that's what I'm good at. I'm really good at that. You know, maybe you just need to get away. Just turn off everything. Right? And just seek the Lord in that way. That's Matthew, that's Mark 1, 34. Luke chapter 4, verses 42 through 43. When the day came, Jesus left, left the crowds, went to a secluded place, and they were searching for him. And came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said, in this instance, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities, for this is I was sent for this purpose. Well, you got many examples of Jesus getting away, being alone, in prayer, before his Father in heaven. 
Matthew 14, 23 says, and he sent the crowds away. There's time to send the crowds away. He went up on the mountain and by himself, by himself to pray. And it was evening. It was morning, it was evening. He was there alone. Again, this is not an admonition of uh, a cause to say we don't pray corporately. Some maybe will try to persuade themselves that this prohibits all prayer meetings. I wouldn't say there's anybody in the building here that would necessarily do that. Um, but I have heard people say, no, 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 I can't pray at home. I pray at home. I got I could pray at home. What does the book of Acts say as it relates to pray? First of all, again, believers pray. We pray in private. We pray, hopefully we're learning, we're going to pray without ceasing. We pray corporately. Believers pray. And when we pray, we obey God and we honor God. What about the early church? Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These with all one mind were continually devoted themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts 2, 42. Classic one, right? They were continually devoting themselves. This is the beginning of the church here. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 4, 24. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. So there's something about that. So that's what we'll be doing tonight. Lifting our voices together with one accord to God. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So there is worship, praise, adoration there. Acts chapter 12, verse 15. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. And what was the church doing when Peter was in prison? A prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Verse 12 says that when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Quite simple. Many will gather together tonight and they'll be praying together. Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. And while they were ministering to the Lord in fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them to do. So before they sent out the missionaries there, there is the church body praying, laying hands on them, praying them, praying for them, and sending them out. And then Acts 16, verse 25. Not such a good example, but that's the example of... Uh, Paul and Silas praying in prison together. So that's not really the example. But there's an example there. Brothers, he says, two brothers praying together. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not use meaningless petitions. So, beloved believers, beware of battling prayers. You know, do you ever catch yourself sometimes? I remember one pastor, he said, sometimes he could, could oh Lord, just did all what I just said yesterday. It's like you're just following the, uh, the roadness of the ritual of your of your prayers. Beware of babbling, praying. Let's look at some examples of other examples in the Bible of praying, okay? We need to pray like Daniel. How did Daniel pray? Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 through 14. Then Daniel began discussing, uh, distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king 
planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began to find a group of accusation, a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no evidence of corruption in so much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. That's pretty cool. They can't find anything with on Daniel. We gotta try to find some charge. We gotta find some way we can get this guy. I can't find anything. They're like, there's nothing that we can find on this guy. Aha, yes there is. You will not find many ground of acquisition against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then the commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. And all the commissioners of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute. Imagine this statute. Imagine if, I don't know, would we be found guilty? There'd be enough evidence for us to be convicted on this charge. That anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. Sometimes I may say to my kids, you know, I want them trying to have them obey in some ways. This is, this is the law of the Medes and Persians here. There's no negotiation here. It cannot be revoked. So the king signs the document and then, of course, after Daniel, actually listen to verse 10, it says, Now Daniel knew that the document was signed. He knows he's going to be sentenced to the lion's den. He entered his house, now in his roof chambers, and he had his windows wide open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had previously been doing. Unashamedly there, in prayer. We need to pray because believers pray, and when we pray, we obey and honor God, our prayers need to be like Daniel, unashamed, unafraid. We need to pray like the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. Imagine when the body of Christ gets together, forget about a season of prayer, persistently, I mean, we're doing a season of prayer, not really five weeks. But imagine persistently if the body of Christ gets together and prays and calls out to God for all the stuff that's going on in the society and all the stuff that's going on in the culture and all the stuff that's going on in the political world and all the stuff that's going on with wars and rumors of wars and all the ways that the world is, you know, spinning out of control. It's always been spinning out of control, you know. Since the fall of man, it's been spinning out of control. But can you imagine? We don't know what would happen. We don't know here. Actually, here, the Church of the Light, we have no know. We have no idea what would happen, what God would do if his people gathered together for five weeks or gathered together persistently in prayer. That's where that Second Chronicles 7, 14 comes in. If my people who are called by my name Right, will pray and humble themselves. And pray. God will hear and heal their land. Persistent widow says here there was a widow in that city and she kept coming to this judge. Give me legal protection for my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling, the judge. But afterward he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow bothers me, I'll give her legal protection. Otherwise, by her continually coming, she wear me out. She will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous thought. Now we're not going to before an unrighteous judge. We're going before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're going before the God of Heaven. We're going uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ who lives and longs to make intercession for us. Sometimes to the point of Here's a prayer in Romans 8. 
there's not even words to express. You've been there. Lord, I'm in the, I don't know how to pray. It's like an out of just our groan, our silent groan. Holy Spirit prays and makes intercession for us. Now, right, and the word said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect? His church. We've said it many times from this pulpit, the issue and the problem in the society and the culture today is not the Democrats, it's not with the Republicans, it's not with, the, it's not with any group that's out there. It's, it's the church. It's the church. It's the sleeping Christians. It's the false teachers. It's the false prophets. Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? It will be delayed long over them. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. <laughs> and then the end of verse 8. It actually also applies, you know, to what we're saying here about hastening the coming day of the Lord from the Second Peter verses uh, in the opportunity we have to hasten the coming day of the Lord by coming together in prayer. There'll be opportunities to hasten the coming day of the Lord. There are opportunities for fellowship or for something else that we do together as a body of Christ. In love, I say what verse 8 says, I tell you that he'll bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's not a guilt thing. I'm not saying that to guilt anybody. I'm saying the reality is when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he, what will he see tonight? I'm not saying that to guilt anybody because I'm just saying, what, what, what will he find? People in love with him? People devoted to him? People devoted to one another? Are people vulnerable? Are people humble? Of people who love each other so much that you know the opportunity to come together in prayer supersedes. Everything. So we need to pray like the persistent widow. We need to pray like Jesus prayed. I mean, there's so many examples that I mean, we might hone in on this one at some point in the series, but you know that prayer in the garden, right? Matthew, I know it's say 23, it's not 23, it's 26, I think, 26, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and says to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two tons of Zebedee and he began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little behind them and fell on his face to the ground and prayed. You've prayed this. I know you've prayed this. My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The agony of his praying there. And he came to the disciples and found them praying right along with him. He said, Pray, watch with me. You know, he found them sleeping. Boy, there's ex ever, ever there was an example of sleeping Christians. There it is. So he said, So you men, could you not watch with me for one hour? And that's true. Again, this is not a guilt thing, but tonight we'll be 6 to 7, we promise you. From 6 to 7. Okay. I'm not sure I have promised that. What happens if something happens while we're praying? I don't know. Our intention is for it to be, our end, from our end, it'll be from 6 to 7, one hour. 
So you may could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying. That you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. We want to pray. We want to pray together. We want to read the word. We want to have fellowship with each other. We want to have private prayer times together. I mean private prayer. We want to have private daily prayer. The spirit is willing. But we give in. I give in. We give in. Too easily to the flesh. The flesh is weak. Here again he went away a second time praying. My father, second time, if this cannot pass away, unless I drink it, your will be done. And now he finds them watching and praying with him. No, again he came to them and found them sleeping. Sleepy Christians, wake up! Your master has coffee. <laughs> For their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more when he came to the disciples. And he found them awake and praying? No. He goes to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour has come. The hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold. Sorry. The one who betrays me is at hand. No need to apologize. Sorry, I'm just trying to look at the time. Believers pray. When we pray, we obey and we honor God. We pray privately, we pray publicly, we pray, we pray without ceasing. We pray corporately. Believers pray. And whenever we pray, we pray and honor God. So the orthopraxy is what we're saying here. Put it into practice. Believers pray. So the challenge and the opportunity for us is what it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so, let's learn how to pray together. Here's the application. An application for the next, for tonight. Application for the next five Sundays. Four Sundays after this is, let's learn how to pray together as a body of Christ. Let's grow in holy. Let's grow in Christ like this. Let's grow in love for each other. That's what church is. Church is supposed to be. Let's look at Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Just hit the highlights here and pray what it looks like. You've read this, you've gone through this. And it's not an admonition to not pray the literal words here, that can be done. I have an admonition not to do that, but you you know, you got this example of the praise and adoration here in the beginning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are sovereign Lord God over my life situation right now, over the situation that I'm in, over the circumstance that I'm in. I'm just using this as an example, right? Hallowed be your name, Lord. Your name is holy. There's that word of praise. There's that word of recognizing who God is, recognizing who we are in the light of his glorious presence. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done, Lord. Not my will be done. Lord, your will be done in this matter, in this situation. I pray, I cry out to you, my sovereign God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today... That's a great admonition. Give us today our daily bread. So there's the prayer for our daily bread. There's prayer for our needs. There's prayer for the needs of others. Give us this day. You ever do that? It's like here in a situation and how's this going to turn out? So just give me the grace. You say, just Lord, just give me the grace. For today. Deal with today. Seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. This is right in the 
part of the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about the worry and the anxiety. Lord, give us today our daily bread. There's a prayer there of confession. Forgive us our debts as we have also have forgiven our debtors. You prayed this, right? And Lord, lead me not in temptation. Lead me not into temptation. Lord, show me the way of escape, as in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Show me the way of escape. Lead me not into temptation to fall and turn away from you. Deliver us, Lord, from the evil one. And then he says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Such a warning there. Think about, we've said this before, a mountain of sins that God has forgiven us of past, present, future. And the absolute danger, and I've heard it out of the mouths of more than one professing, I use the word professing Christian. I've heard it out of the mouth of more than one professing Christian. No. I will not forgive. Professing Christian, I will not forgive. It's an evidence of not being a believer in Jesus Christ right there. So let's learn how to pray together. Let's learn how to pray together tonight as a church. The Bible says, looking forward for the hastening and coming day of the Lord. And the orthopraxy challenge is believers pray. Let's pray. The orthopraxy challenge for life is, Lord, teach us to pray. So one way of learning to be taught to pray is, Learning how to pray corporately together as a body of Christ. Quote for the week. Oh, I forgot to read the doctrine. Okay, back me up. Thank you. Actually, so the doctrine relates to fellowship, right? Rightfully so. Communion of saints, fellowship, prayer, corporately, praying together. All saints who are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and by faith, although they are not by this made one person with him, have fellowship in his graces. For the fellowship of his graces is worship, prayer, praise, corporate prayer. Fellowship in his grace is suffering, death, resurrection, and glory. They also receive and enjoy real eternal benefits from all of these. Also being united to love one another. I keep saying it. We gather together for as a that's why even whether it's corporate worship, it's not just about me or you as an individual, and whether or not what I get out of coming, or what the individual gets out of coming, even in the essence of corporate worship, there's an element of one another. It's like there's an element of one another. Also, being united to and what love for one another, they have communion, they share in each other's gifts and graces, and are obligated. Obligated to the orderly performance of such public, like this, and private duties. The service is listed in both of the proof texts. You've got to look at the doctrine for that. But as lead, as lead to their mutual good by the inward and outward man, spiritually and physically. So there's an element of prayer, communion, prayer, fellowship. There's an aspect of prayer that relates to the fellowship of the saints. Okay, quote for the week is Charles Spurgeon. How perfect is this model of prayer. So fit for man to pray. So suitable to be laid before the throne of the majesty on high. Oh, that we may have grace to copy it all of our days. Jesus, our King, will not refuse to present a prayer which is of his own drawing up and is directed to the Father who he loves to glorify. So that's the essence of it, right, brothers and sisters? Even in the essence of corporate prayer offered up to God, directed to the Father whom He loves to glorify.
Matthew 6, verse 5 says, and when you pray. Verse 6 says, and when, when you pray. Verse 7 says, and when you pray. In verse 9 it says, this then is how you should pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for um, countless teachings in the Bible on prayer, this being one of them. Teach the church of new life. Teach the pastor. Teach the elders. Teach the beloved brethren. Teach us together. For these next five weeks. How to pray. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.